We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? All right, let's... Uh, yes. <laughs> I apologize for the uh, slightly rocky start here, I guess, with the coordinating between the, the uh, technology operators and those of us who are going to be speaking today. Um, but thank you very much and welcome to this uh, conversation about social responsibility and the, the internet. Um, I'm Paul Mitchell, and I'm your host for the day, uh, for this particular topic. I'll just to provide a little bit of setup, and then I'll ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves. And uh, then we have some prepared questions for everyone to take a shot at. And, uh, and then hopefully we'll have some opportunity left in our time slot to be able to have some um, interaction between the panelists. So just as a setup, a uh, digital transition is well underway, albeit at very different rates and in different places. Every sector of society is touched by the drive to digitize and realize the benefits that are possible. And there's enormous amount of potential for good, but this requires strong awareness and capacity building efforts to meet the challenges, to create technologies that are inclusive and crafted to the real needs of societies in a people-centric way. Today, the panelists, I hope all of you who are panelists, are going to discuss corporate social responsibility in the context of this drive for digitalization and the potential to address some of the most intractable challenges that face the world. There are many ways to define corporate social responsibility, and for our purposes today, I will start with a basic definition where corporate social responsibility aims at the sustainable governance of digital technologies while respecting human rights. And the CSR role is really key to handling the new relationships between labor and workers and technology and for achieving equity in access among all of the different sectors of society. We have an excellent panel today. Um, and I have three questions that I'm going to ask the panel. First, what does corporate so social responsibility in the digital world mean to you? And what are the chances and cha challenges of digital transformation? Is it possible to regulate digital technologies without slowing down development and innovation? And if so, what and how should it be regulated to address the social responsibility issues? And Finally, how should the relationship between business growth, sustainable development, and governance of digital technologies be defined? I'll ask each of you to hold your initial interventions at three minutes so that we'll have enough time to, uh, to have everyone have, have an opportunity to speak. Um, and then to close out the session, we'll ask the panelists, they'll have the opportunity to inform us all about any voluntary commitments addressing digital growth and the items that are being discussed today. Um, I'm going to ask each panelist in turn to introduce themselves. Um, and I'll start with um, Noel Curran. Hi there, Paul. Uh, good to join you. Uh, my name is Noel Curran. I'm Director General of the European Broadcasting Union. We represent 115 different broadcasting, public service broadcasting media organizations in 57 countries. I'm Irish. I was previously worked in public and commercial media and uh, was Director General at the National Broadcaster in Ireland. Great. Thank you. And Jan? Yes, good afternoon, uh, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Jan Kleisen. I'm Director of Information Society and Action Against Crime at the Council of Europe, uh, an organization which brings together 47 European countries 
plus five uh, observer states, and it caters for some uh, 820 million European citizens. My responsibilities include uh, internet governance, uh, data protection, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, cybercrime, uh, to name just a few. And I look very much forward to the discussion. Thank you. Uh, I have on my screen um, INT ESP and INT FRA. I'm assuming those are um, placeholders, but if uh, any, we have any other people on the line, if you could please uh, unmute yourself and let us know you're here. I'm, I'm Lucio Ruiz. I am the uh, secretary of the Dicastery of Communication of the Holy See and we are in charge of all the communication of the Holy Father all around the world with the different media. Uh, I'm coming from Rome. Thank you. We have anyone else? Uh, um, yes, I'm Baratang Mia, the founder and the CEO of Girl Hype, Women Who Code Movement. And we focus on teaching women and girls digital skills uh, to make sure that we bridge the digital gap that exists in the tech space. Thank you. Thank you. And anyone else? Okay. Then I'd like to, uh, to go straight to the questions and the, the discussions. And... Um, Jan, perhaps we'll start with you and ask you to, to answer the question, uh, what does corporate social responsibility in the digital world mean to you and the chances and challenges of digital transformation? Thank you very much, Paul. I'll try to stay within the, within the three minutes. Um, like you, let me stress that, of course, digital transformation can be a tremendous force for the good and offers great possibilities to make this world a more equitable, fairer, safer, and also more sustainable, sustainable place. Um, at the same time, uh, digital transformation uh, can bring uh, considerable risk, and I'll come to that in a moment. And as an organization, the Council of Europe, which was founded to defend human rights, promote the rule of law and democracy, um, we have started to look at this at a fairly, fairly early stage. Um, for instance, data protection, digital transformation, uh, brought enormous possibilities to enhance the treatment of data, uh, but of course also the manipulation or abuse uh, of data the, and infringement of the right to privacy, which is why 40 years ago the Council of Europe established the world's first protection, uh, convention, first treaty on the protection uh, of personal data. 20 years ago, uh, the first convention uh, against cybercrime, which has since been followed by a number of specific treaties to fight uh, the abuse of children, specifically also online, uh, thinking of child pornography and other forms of abuse, grooming. Uh, a more recent treaty we have is on um, uh, medicrime, falsification of, of medical products, to name you, to give you just some of the examples of issues that need to be dealt with. Um, we are a lawmaking organization. We try to uh, deal with the challenges uh, through the adoption of common legal standards, uh, but binding legal standards, uh, treaties, which will be transposed, are transposed into national law, and where the parties to these treaties help each other or control each other in the uh, execution of their obligations and the implementation of the, of the provisions of the, of, of the treaties. I think that is important to, to stress here. Um, in order to, uh, to do so, we very much need the private sector. It is clear that corporate social responsibility, which I would understand as the awareness and willingness of the private sector to, to shoulder responsibilities that come with the development of their products in a way that, from the Council of Europe point of view, respects human rights, respects the rule of law, and is, uh, not how, is conducive to democ the democratic process and not harmful to it, that uh, companies shoulder these responsibilities and accept them. 
uh, a number of these treaties I just mentioned, this legal text, directly address the private sector. Uh, for instance, the uh, Convention on the Sexual Abuse of Children has a couple of provisions that directly uh, are um, addressed to the private, the private sector. Uh, we have a whole series of policy recommendations uh, that do the same. In order to uh, involve the private sector even more with our, with our work, with the lawmaking, uh, the Council of Europe has opened up a partnership uh, some five years ago now, and currently some 28 uh, major tech tele, uh, telephone companies uh, from around the world have signed uh, with the Council of Europe an exchange of letters in order to promote human rights, rule of law and democracy through their work with us. And we give them a seat at the table. Uh, I'll stop here now uh, and we'd be very happy to elaborate further with, in relation to the more specific questions. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to actually move to uh, Maya Baratang and, uh, and have um, your view on this particular topic. Um, uh, for me, I, I believe that the sustainable developmental goals of the UN focus on addressing human rights and the planet's well-being by way of 17 goals. That already encompasses poverty eradication and the promotion of health, women, climate, and more. Essentially, what the SDGs are doing is focusing on transforming the world already and giving a guidance to corporate social investment. investment. And this is a good foundation to guide for a better world. We are trying to transform the world, but we aren't doing much to transform the individuals leading the movement and the individuals that are creating and deploying technology. Um, that focus on individuals needs to be immediate because in that way, we're shifting their minds from being driven by profit, focal point, to one of growth and addressing the 17 goals that are already out um, elaborated by the UN. And that way we can have tangible uh, motive and the betterment of all the humankind. Sustainable development and digital technologies for all intents and its purposes connected. However, the bias is an, is an inherent old as human civilization. This can and is currently seen in businesses and the technology being deployed, being inherently biased towards race, gender, disability, and even age. Historically and to date, members of dominant groups or nations make biased decisions to the detriment of other groups or nations. Transforming of individuals, which I believe is the biggest thing, especially the leaders in the tech space, um, with transforming their mindset is truly at the core of inclusion. Um, that's the power to total societal impact. I come from Africa, a continent of early adopters of technology. The youth of Africa are extremely hungry for inclusive opportunities, not just by words, but by deeds. An inclusive business model does not have to necessarily come from governments. It can come directly from business leaders themselves. There are companies that are currently bigger than nations, and their profits are bigger than some African countries' physical budgets. So what we are asking technology creators and big business to do is to focus and realize that humanity is at its core and, and it needs to be saved. Um, because at the moment and at the rate we are producing technology and AI, people are already um, scared of losing jobs. People are already scared of what's going to happen to them in the future. And technology is not there to create such mindsets. Technology is supposed to create opportunities and change people's lives. Um, as a black female entrepreneur, the most significant part of my journey in contributing to, build, to bridging the, the gender gap in tech and bridging inclus inclusiveness in the space is realizing that it's going to be a big challenge, especially because the industry, the industry is still very white and male dominated. I've also been, and my job at the moment has been part of going around and encouraging big tech businesses 
to realize that essentially we are their partners um, and customers. If this is understood, big tech businesses will comprehend that their success in the next 100 years will depend on us buying their products. And if we're not included, we won't be part of buying. How, how do you buy a product that's against you, that's not improving your life in any way, but making profits for someone? I find that very challenging. And at the moment, we live in a world where a global generation is extremely conscious of justice. People are taking it upon their hands. Equity and equality is something that's at the forefront. The injustice against humanity and our planet is not being tolerated anymore. Um, the global youth have high standards and are holding corporates accountable to their actions. We've already seen that happening all over the world. Business leaders that are becoming more influential at this time of our lives um, come from the tech space. They, we already see where the trends are going, what decisions are, are, are they making, and what kind of the future they're holding for us. And because of that, we need to bring them to the table and realize that IGF and any other movement that's trying to govern sustainability and inclusion has to have them in the forefront of decision making because they are the ones who are building tech and deploying and deciding the future because at the moment tech is really deciding the future. Um, their personal ambitions of profit making model is slowly moving away. I've seen that happening at the World Economic Forum discussions and how people are discussing and negotiating businesses. Business deals now, the language is moving from profit to how can I make a difference. Those businesses that are speaking like that on how can I make a difference, that will show in their profits and it will show in how loyal us as their customers will be because they would be inclusive and they would include all of us as human beings. Um, those are the businesses and investors that I see succeeding in the future that focus on sustainable global impact. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I'll turn to Monsignor Ruiz, please. Thank you. About the corporate social responsibility, no? Newton's third law of motion said, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. More generally, we can say we can say for every action there are a reaction, and in our life we can say every action has a consequences, both positive and negative. Keeping this principle in the mind is fundamental, and for me is the heart of the social responsibility. It must be applied in all situations and regard individuals society, and our world, our common home. We must therefore consider the positive and negative consequences of our actions. It is not possible to talk about the real progress and real development if part of the humanity can be displaced, replaced, confused, and lose the meaning of life. As everybody knows, there are many developments that have resulted with these consequences. Well, it is therefore important to talk about the chances and challenges. The chances, the wonderful of everything that can contemplate in the digital age. Also, the promises for emerging technologies, there is no doubt about the great potential that the digital transformation produces, is really a beautiful dream. But that is also our challenge, remain into the dream being trapped 
in fascination over technological achievement without looking at the negative consequences, without looking for those who are left behind. It is necessary to look at the harm that can be done. And not only to be fascinating, but the beautiful thing that can be achieved. To really dream big, we must consider any possible effect of our action and decision. Today's world is experiencing too much suffering and also death. Development in nutrition, health, education, and also freedom, privacy, security, peace, are not aligned with technological progress. They don't grow at the same pace. Well, for me, social responsibility in the digital world means being accountable by design. Accountable by design. To look all the consequences, positive one to promote, negative one to avoid. For all the action for today and for tomorrow, for the individuals, for the society, and for the world, our common home. Thank you very much. I really liked the uh, beautiful dream concept uh, and of accountable by design. And I think we maybe come back to that in a little bit. Uh, move on to a, another question to build our, our framework here. Is it, is it possible, do you think, to regulate digital technologies without slowing down development and innovation? And if so, what? Should be regulated, and how should it be regulated to address social responsibility concerns? And uh, just go in the same order. I think it's okay. So let's start with. Uh, no. Start with with me. Is it? Yes. All right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> hi. Um, in terms of the uh, yes, is is the answer? You know, I, can the media? business and the broadcasting business and it's been one of the most innovative uh, uh, areas uh, over the last 20 years that we've seen in terms of reacting to audience trends uh, but it's also regulated and uh, I think that it is uh, you know the two are not mutually exclusive and I think it's important that we realize that and particularly realize it uh, when it comes to looking at the digital sector. I think the last thing we want to do is stop innovation uh, in the digital sector. Uh, it is a massive uh, benefit to our society. Uh, it is uh, bringing a huge amount of positives, a lot of negatives as well that we really need to be wary of, but it is bringing a huge amount of positives. I think the kind of regulation that we need to see is, is, is back to a lot of kind of basic values. It's around elements like transparency, uh, where we understand better the choices and decisions that are being made around algorithms, et cetera, uh, by these platforms. I think it comes down to sharing, you know, be it data or be it other elements like that. Uh, I think it comes down to a key component, which is findability, which is who makes the choice when you are looking for information, who makes the choice um, and designs the algorithm that will, that will present uh, information, some information to you before others. What are the decision-making processes? How do you find trusted sources of news and information? Uh, and what, as I say, are the technological decisions that are being made behind that? So I think you've got a whole range of things like that. 
And, you know, I think there are strides being made. I think we've seen with, uh, uh, we've seen the debate shift, I think, uh, in, in recent times around what are the responsibilities of those in the technical sector. I think we've seen a lot more focus on, and we've seen the negative impact of disinformation. Uh, so I think we've seen a lot more focus on what is causing this, how can we stop that? And, I, and uh, so I, I, I think the ground has shifted in some regards uh, around all of this. Uh, and I think we've seen it at European level with the Digital Services Act, the Digital Marketing Act. Uh, we've seen it in terms of commissions and groups looking at misinformation and disinformation. And we're actively involved in, in, in a lot of those. And we've seen it at, at organizational level where uh, organizations are working, trying to work with some of the tech companies and tech giants around what we might achieve uh, in terms of uh, voluntary or not uh, regulation uh, to ensure that uh, the public receive um, trusted sources of information, to uh, also to ensure that the public are protected against all of those negative downsides uh, that you have on uh, when it comes to some of the innovations and some of the technology that we're seeing. So I, I, I feel that there is a realization. I think that needs a realization of, of, of a need for some regulation. And I think we're now at a stage of trying to shape exactly what that is. Uh, but I say again, this is not about stopping innovation. And I do not believe that having regulation uh, necessarily stops uh, having the correct type of regulation necessarily stops innovation and development in the technology sector. Paul, I can't hear you. I can't hear you, Paul, sorry. I'm sorry, having microphone problems today. Um, I just wanted to thank you for, uh, for the uh, outline there and turn to Mia next. And uh, Mia, could you share your views on the regulation question? Um, I agree with uh, the previous speaker that we can't really stifle innovation and creativity. I, I just think regulations have to be there for ethical reasons because I think what happens with technology is that it, it enables us to solve lots of human problems. And that comes through creativity and innovation and the freedom of the creator to be able to test different algorithms. What we need is to get our governments to really get the infrastructure right, to get the data access, the models that are being tested in terms of creation of new technologies have um, a better framework in terms of the research being done, the rollout, people have proper internet access to be able to participate in the early stages of technology. Because at the moment, we're still building tools, testing them if they work or they don't work. Now, if we regulate that, we're really going to stifle innovation. Technology en enables us to live longer. I mean, look, we just came from COVID, and we need lots and lots of research and innovation. With that in mind, if we regulate too much, then we lose the point um, of the revolution of industri industrialization in technologies. Um, the challenge at the moment is that it's generating a massive, massive um, um, divide of the digital divide and the divide between the rich and the poor. And it's now perpetuating rich nations and poor nations to be in charge. Now that I might, I don't think it's regulations that we need, but I think it's interventions of coming up with good standard and good models and proper governance that is united globally 
to make sure that both quantitative and qualitative research from both industry and society is done properly and it's cr increasing the real average global human life and betterment of all of us. The ethics should be right. Whose ethics is it? It's something that we all need to discuss and it's something that we need to get right as the global community because at the moment all our ethics are, are quite interesting. But I, I think if we leave technology to the technology deployers and technology creators to do whatever they need, it's, it's, it's a loss. We need a balance. Now how that is going to be balanced, I think it's something that we need to discuss through standards and better norms. And it, will, it doesn't have to evolve with time. It has to be done cabbing, making sure that, that our planet is not being damaged in the process of creating technology and human life is not going to be more injustice against humanity because somebody is creating technology. If they can cap their biases, that would be better. Thank you, and yeah. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. Um, of course, self-regulation and uh, uh, is often heard as uh, often advanced as an alternative to to regulation uh, but i would state here i would like to to uh, argue that in the field of new technologies uh, where self-regulation can be a very useful complementary tool it it is not sufficient and let me perhaps take the um, take the example of of the current crisis we're in uh, the pandemic, uh, because I'm afraid we're, the fact that we are meeting online is on the one hand a tribute to the power of technology and to all the innovation, uh, and on the other hand, of course, also an example of, uh, of our limits, of our limits there. Um, it is clear that artificial intelligence, for instance, has greatly enhanced the development of vaccine, vaccines. Um, I think the, the real life, the real time sharing, the extremely rapid analysis of data, um, other uh, machine learning processes that contributed to the development of the vaccine uh, have given us tools that we wouldn't have had, say, 10 years ago. Uh, at the same time, uh, staying with the pandemic, artificial intelligence, uh, no doubt, is also playing a role, continues to play a role in the polarization of our societies uh, because of the way uh, social uh, media, for instance, and internet service providers um, channel information, the algorithms that are at work there, uh, the filter bubbles that are created, uh, the yeah, lack of access to alternative views that a number that an increasingly large number of people are having. We see that we see this with the pandemic. Uh, we see this also in the overall uh, democratic debate and in the uh, political landscape in an increasing number of of, of countries. Um, you, the question was, how do, does one define the relationship between regulation and innovation? I would say it's mutually reinforcing. Uh, again, staying with the pandemic, uh, medicine, the medicine, uh, medicine industry, medical industry, is one of the most tightly regulated uh, areas in, 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 on the planet, uh, sectors uh, of industry on the planet. Yet, as the uh, vaccine, vaccines have shown, uh, also highly innovative extremely innovative, and the very strict regulation has in no ways hampered innovation, uh, but it has, I think, produced good innovation, uh, innovation uh, for the improvement of, of, of a situation. Um, Self-regulation, of course, ethical standards can be extremely useful as a source of insp inspiration, but uh, let's make no mistake, they do not confer rights on users or citizens, and they do not confer obligations uh, legal obligations on the companies or those that use them. And importantly, they also do not offer remedies if something goes wrong. So uh, with government regulation, co-regulation, if you like, also with industry very much on board in, in, in designing the, the, the regulation, um, one can, I think, create, like for, for, for the, the medicine industry, uh, the, medical, the medical sector, a framework which uh, enhances innovation but does confer rights, uh, does uh, provide for remedies, and does create uh, obligations. It also has the initial, uh, the additional, sorry, not the initial, the additional advantage 
of creating a level playing field. Um, with self-regulation, certain companies may be much stricter uh, than others, uh, and that might put them perhaps at a comparative advantage or disadvantage, uh, uh, according to your point of view. Um, when you have regulation, international regulation, you will create a level playing field for companies, uh, which I think is in the interest of their business models. It's certainly also in the interest, I think, of their customers and of, of the citizens. On artificial intelligence, for instance, um, the Council of Europe has just finished uh, the elements that will go into what we hope will be the world's first treaty on artificial intelligence, on which negotiations will start at the beginning of next year. Uh, it is being drafted with the participation of not only the member states, but also a whole series of non-member states, but very importantly, industry and civil society. So a multi-stakeholder concept, very well known to the IGF discussions. And I think that format is, is offers the best guarantees to ensure that innovation will be innovation for the good, that the products will be trustworthy, that the processes leading to these products will be transparent, and that the users are not just uh, objects, but subjects with rights and remedies. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great lead into actually a little bit, the opportunity to discuss a little bit more the relationship between business and business growth and how businesses make decisions about the, uh, things like deciding on self-regulation or trying to propose various ethical standards and how we can um, create alignment at a global level um, where it's possible, where it may not be possible. How do we address the differences that will then, you know, be part of the ecosystem that we are all sort of trying to work, work in together? Um, I'm going to open to any any of the panelists for a little bit of discussion on that. Well, I, I just come in on that uh, briefly, Paul. I think, um, you know, I go back to something that Maya said uh, earlier on. You know, I think that businesses are realizing the benefits of uh, of, of, of policies and, and goals that look at issues like sustainability, uh, that look at issues uh, like diversity. Uh, not across the board, but I think a lot of businesses are. You know, certainly within our own field, uh, we know that, first off, they are core to our values. We also know that they are increasingly important to uh, our audiences, particularly young audiences. We know we have a long way to go in some of these areas. You know, I, I, again, I agree with Maya that, that the media uh, industry is too white, too male, too particularly particular demographics uh, dominated. But I do think there is a growing realization of uh, the importance of these issues. Uh, so I think that elements like that are, are really positive. I think you mentioned there about um, you know, how businesses will make decisions around issues like self-regulation or not. I think a lot of businesses will go, will, 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 will opt for self-regulation uh, uh, as a first option. And I would, I would totally agree with Jan that self-regulation has a role to play in certain areas and in certain areas of media. My experience of dealing with uh, with the, the tech companies is that self-regulation doesn't work. You know, I was I was on the the EU uh, expert group on misinformation, and uh, you know, I think some of these larger organisations uh, need to be pushed, and uh, they 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 need to know that that uh, regulation will follow if if they don't adhere to set goals and uh, and and sign up to and deliver on those so I, I i think you know in in those kind of areas i think there are some areas where there is common agreement and i, I think it's now a matter of of the governing bodies uh finding how we can implement those in terms of sustainability goals in terms of diversity in terms of issues like regulation and, and what is the most practical and effective way of getting real change in those areas for us. Thank you. Monsignor so, Ruiz, I yeah. wonder if you have some uh, some thoughts in this area. Yeah, I want uh, to, um, to add just a 
little idea about the present argument about the regulation and, and promotion, um, because I, I think that is necessary to put together both things, because promotion and regulation are not the opposite, opposite things, but both together must work and allow us to work in the right direction. That means no one that really love, that, that really want to live, understand that the control, the limitation of something that could be wrong is something bad. And for this reason, the question of the control, the regulation, is to define the, the meaning, the objective, the goal of this regulation. Because if the regulation is good, it's something that promotes more and more the action. It's something that allows us to, to develop better and for all the people in the world. We need to assure that everybody in the world can access to the technology because there are many people in the world that doesn't have the technology and need also just for their life. Well, that for me is, is, is extremely important. It's not the opposite thing. It's something that must work together because one and the other working together can allow us to really develop something better and something sure for everybody. Can't hear you, Paul. Pa I wonder if, uh, if you have uh, thoughts about the role of standardization across the, this particular topic. Open for anyone. Okay, no takers. Um, we've talked a little bit about um, how, how to think about the, the movement towards corporate source responsibility um, and, and the idea that we have self-regulation and regulation, uh, uh, formal regulation happening at the same time. I wonder if you could speak a little bit to where you think the boundary lines should be um, between the self-regulation and formal regulatory body regulation. If I may, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the boundary line for us uh, here in, uh, at the Council of Europe, for the member states of the Council of Europe, would lie where the effects of the technology or the use of the technology, rather, uh, the way it's being implemented, would have a direct effect on what uh, would be considered real ba the basic human rights or basic uh, elements of rule of law or, or of democracy. Uh, to give you an example, to stay perhaps with the example of artificial intelligence, but that's a, as a form of digital, digital transformation, digital technology. Uh, when the state, when governments use artificial intelligence, for instance, law enforcement uses facial recognition, uh, which we know can lead and has led to, to uh, clear cases of discrimination. Uh, of clear cases of interferences with, with people's uh, individual, of people's rights, um, then there is a clear need to go beyond self-regulation. Uh, when it comes to a lot of other issues, uh, uses rather of artificial intelligence, um, perhaps uh, the music industry, whether you are suggested a Beatles song or a Rolling Stones song, is not such a major impact, although some might argue, but perhaps it's not such a major impact on, on your basic, or has such a di direct effect on your basic rights. Uh, Self-regulation uh, may, may, well may well do the trick. But in all areas where the use of, of new technologies, uh, digital technologies, especially the use by 
governments, but also where governments allow private actors to use digital technologies, which have a huge impact on, 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 on the rights uh, of citizens. And I stay with facial recognition because I mentioned law enforcement when it's used by the state, but we also know that, for instance, a lot of private actors now use facial recognition uh, with, uh, of course, consequences for people's privacy uh, and, uh, and other rights. So when that's the case, I would argue that is where the, where the line is crossed, where self-regulation can be a useful form of inspiration, uh, but that it's not, uh, not sufficient because it simply does not offer enough protection. Okay, thank you. If in our in our final few minutes, I think this is an opportunity for each of you to uh, outline a little bit what you plan to do. Uh, if you've got anything on the on the drawing board that is new and interesting in this space, and and share your your thoughts and and potential commitments in this space. Uh, ask Mia first, and take it away. Um, I look at the new technologies that are coming up now as a big concern for public health. Uh, most women are using digital technologies. They're not creators of technology. And the biggest, biggest driver of social illnesses, um, most women are seen psychologists, young people are so into technology so much that they're not taking into consideration what, tech, what are the effects of technology that are not written. So we look at the benefits, but what it's doing to the society and the health, emotional health of young people and what um, the driver of what women should be doing and not women having no jobs in the tech space being the biggest driver for what I do. So. For me, I would continue making sure that there's enough investment going to women, advocating for women's rights and the biasnesses that's coming through AI to be taken into consideration and work with the big businesses themselves. Because I firmly believe that the creators of technology don't intentionally want to be biased or racist or injustice that is happening out of the use of technology. It's not their intention. They just want to solve issues of the world. And in the process of solving problems of the world, other issues are popping up. And that balance is where I fit in and where we fit in as governance to make sure that history does not repeat itself again of a pattern that excludes the same people over and over through history. And uh, Monsignor Ruiz? Well, if the challenge is how to promote and develop uh, in the inclusive and diverse technologies, I personally believe that the key is education and the challenge is the personal responsibility as a basis of the social responsibility because in an educated freedom, we can find the help to use what the digital culture can offer, and that is wonderful. Follow also an ethical path to value the human person, request the transparency to know exactly what happened and demand the legislation in order to control and to promote the creativity. For this reason, from our part, the, our commitment, as you want, I can say three steps. First is trying to study in order to understand every day better what is exactly inclusive and diverse innovation and which is the role of the emerging technologies in order to share it around the world. Second step is the training 
in the application of the digital technologies in order to apply it in the promotion of the human being, the human dignity, and the meaning of life. And the third one is to work in a team to develop a thought in an ethical way, ethical path for the digital age. Thank you. Uh, no? Yeah, I think for us, uh, three things as well. One is that we will continue to invest, our members continue to invest in innovation in this area. Uh, we have huge technology and innovation departments, even within the EBU, we're pushing a lot of uh, new innovative uh, digital uh, services around European news, around uh, uh, detecting fake news, AI, etc. So I think we would definitely commit that we will continue to innovate. We will also commit to continuing to try and provide trusted sources of news be it through our own services, be it through uh, what we invest in training of journalism and fact-checking and in, in uh, all of the standards that we apply, because I think that that is uh, also critical. We also work with others. We're part of the uh, trusted uh, uh, journalism trust initiative with organizations like Reporters Without Borders. Uh, we're part of the Trusted News Initiative, which the BBC leads uh, media organizations around the world. So we will continue to commit to that. And then finally, we will continue to push for a regulatory change and uh, push for proper governance of the kind of technological and digital uh, environment and innovations that we're seeing. And we will continue to push it for that at Brussels level, at international level, and at national level. Uh, so I think for us, they're the, the three things that we would uh, very happily commit to in terms of this. Great. Thank you. And Jan, you get the last word. Thank you. Thank you very much. For us, uh, the coming year, as mentioned, we'll start negotiations on a legal framework, hopefully a treaty. Uh, on artificial intelligence based on our standards, Council of Europe standards, human rights, democracy, and, and rule of law, to come up with overall principles. Uh, we'll negotiate that, as mentioned, together with business and also civil society at, at the table. Uh, we will also be, uh, we are, have started work and will continue work on more specific uh, legal standards on particular applications of, of uh, artificial intelligence. For instance, self-driving cars, work is underway uh, towards a possible, uh, again, a convention, a legal uh, tre a tre treaty, legal standards on the responsibilities relating to self-driving cars. And we'll also be looking at very much like now on the impact of digital technologies on freedom of expression in the widest possible sense. So these are three of our priorities for the coming years. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all of you for participating today. We are right on time. And I uh, hope we all have an excellent idea this week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.